Lucy Letby, serial killer. What is she? The conclusion. Hello, I'm H.G. Tudor, and thank you for joining me as we reach the conclusion as to what Lucy Letby is, which also enables us to understand why she killed. Lucy Letby is a 33-year-old woman who is currently serving life sentences for the murder of seven babies and the attempted murder of six more. She will never be released from prison. Her crimes have proven shocking and upsetting, generating anger, sorrow and revulsion. They've also created bewilderment and confusion. How could someone kill newborn babies? Even worse, how could someone who belongs to a profession that's very foundation is based on caring and healing, murder her charges. The tempting response is to label Letby a psychopath. After all, aren't psychopaths cold-hearted killing machines? Don't they revel in the wielding of power, getting their kicks from playing God? Surely there's a clear correlation between what Letby has done and the behaviour of a psychopath. Well... We are going to find out. We start by looking at some of the company that Letby keeps. We've seen other cases of nurses who have targeted children. Beverly Allert, arrested in 1991, attacked 15 children in two months with insulin and air bubbles, killing four. Many were infants. Seriously disturbed since adolescence, Alet had reported numerous illnesses over the years and had even mutilated herself so often she had become a notorious patient for area doctors. Her diagnosis was Munchausen syndrome by proxy. It didn't help her in court. She received 13 life sentences. A more notorious case is that of licensed vocational nurse Janine Jones. She suspected, in relation to the deaths of dozens of infants and young children during the 1970s and 1980s. She was caught while working in a paediatrics clinic in Careville, Texas. It wasn't long after she was hired before several children succumbed to inexplicable seizures. 15-month-old Chelsea McClellan, brought to the clinic for a routine checkup, ended up dead. A week after the funeral, Chelsea's mother spotted Jones at the cemetery, kneeling at the foot of the grave, wailing the child's name. Mrs McClellan confronted her, but Jones stared at her, rose and walked away. Dr Holland, Jones's employer, learned that just before Chelsea died, a bottle of a muscle relaxant with the power to paralyse had turned up missing. Jones found it. Holland saw a needle hole in the rubber top. She tested the contents. The bottle was fire, filled with saline. She fired Jones and called police. On October 12, 1982, a grand jury considered the evidence and a test of Chelsea's exhumed remains confirmed the presence of the muscle relaxant. Another grand jury looked into 47 suspicious deaths of children at Bexar County Medical Center Hospital that occurred while Jones worked there. She was indicted on two counts of murder and several charges of injury to other children. Jose Antonio Flores, six months old, had gone into fatal cardiac arrest while in her care. Testing showed an overdose of heparin, an anticoagulant. No one had ordered it for him. Also, under Jones's care, Rolando Santos, a survivor, had experienced inexplicable cardiac arrest with extensive bleeding. Jones had requested to be put in charge of the sickest patients, which placed her close to children more likely to die. When they did, colleagues had noticed that Jones seemed to thrive on the emergency. Afterwards, she'd asked to take the corpses to the morgue. There, she'd sometimes hold it while rocking in a chair. Some reports said she'd also like to predict which children would die. Some people enter healthcare professions to gain attention or a sense of power. Wolfe and Donoghue Smith in 2019 
ran a qualitative study on nurses who killed patients in healthcare institutions. Medication poisoning was the most frequent method and dominance power the most frequent motive. Victims are readily available. The atmosphere of care engenders trust that everyone's there to heal, and the most vulnerable are those who cannot tell, i.e. babies. A study published in the Journal of Forensic Sciences in 2006 examined 90 cases from 20 countries of criminal prosecutions of healthcare professionals between 1970 and 2006. 54 defendants had been convicted. Nurses, male and female, comprised 86% of those defendants. From several of these studies and additional cases, we know that nurses who endangered or killed a number of patients had multiple red flag behaviours. They might have gained macabre nicknames from patients or staff, were in rooms where unexpected deaths occurred and weren't assigned there, were secretive or deceptive about innocuous things, liked to predict that a patient would die, were associated with suspicious incidents at different institutions, craved attention, hung around after a death to experience the reactions, lied about credentials, or falsified their work records or medical access reports. They didn't operate fully under the radar. Colleagues noticed them. With Letby, numerous of those red flags have been apparent. At Jones's, first, at Jones's first trial for the murder of Chelsea McLennan, the prosecutor said she had a hero complex. She needed to endanger her patients so she could save them. As I've mentioned, similar to the behaviour of Letby, of both fire starter and fire extinguisher. Jones was convicted and she received 99 years in prison. At a trial for the injury of Rolanda Santos, a statistical report was the key evidence. An investigator stated that the children were 25% more likely to have a cardiac arrest when Jones was in charge. Jones was found guilty and received 60 more years to her sentence. Harold Shipman is one of the UK's most notorious serial killers. A GP in Hyde, Greater Manchester, he was convicted in 2000 of murdering 15 people between 1995 and 1998, but is suspected to have potentially killed as many as 250 between 1975 and 1998. He was stated to have narcissistic personality disorder. There are those that refer to him as having a God complex, but that was a manifestation of his narcissism. Now, we come to Lucy Letby. We've looked at a lot of evidence. I've covered even more evidence, but not always included it, as it duplicates points that have been made already by other evidence. We are going to consider whether she is an empath, a normal, narcissistic, a narcissist, i.e. she has narcissistic personality disorder, someone with antisocial personality disorder, which for ease of reference we will refer to as a psychopath, and also consider when it, whether any other factors or conditions are applicable. For example, post-traumatic stress disorder, a psychotic break, or schizophrenia. Let us begin with empath. What is an empath? An empathic individual is somebody who has both empathic and narcissistic traits. Sometimes the narcissistic traits can be strong, but their empathic traits will be stronger. This individual is guided by their emotional empathy, which causes them to conduct themselves in their day-to-day -day life in a way so that they operate, function, make decisions and behave with that emotional empathy. They recognize boundaries, exhibit genuine compassion, and they do so to a great depth and for a wide range of people. There are some people who, seeking to be controversial, suggest that empaths don't exist. They do. Of course, there are many people who think that they're empaths and actually they're not, and they're unaware mid-range narcissists. But that's a discussion for another time. Empaths exist, and those are the key elements of what they are. Given the fact that Lu Lucy Letby has murdered babies, it's patently clear that to do so, there's an absence of emotional empathy, and therefore, presumably, that must preclude, preclude her from being an empath. However, there are two fundamental factors 
that might actually remove such a conclusion and confirm that she is one. Firstly, her behaviour prior to the commencement of her killing in 2015 actually supports the presence of emotional empathy. She cared for hundreds of babies. She was caring towards her friends. It was spoken about how she essentially had a backpack with medical supplies in, that she was like a Mary Poppins. She was seen as a dutiful daughter, a hard worker. She was never in trouble. She wasn't a lawbreaker. All of that supports the presence of emotional empathy, that she didn't act with a sense of entitlement, that she was accountable for her behaviours, that she was considerate to other individuals, she took into account the feelings of other people, she exhibited caring, compassion, honesty, decency. Secondly, emotional empathy is not fixed. It ebbs and flows like a tide and can be temporarily reduced or extinguished so that a person behaves without emotional empathy. For example, somebody might be under severe financial pressure that causes them to steal from their employer. Somebody might have not eaten for days that causes them to steal food from a shop. A victim who has been repeatedly abused by a narcissist reaches a tipping point and lashes out, perhaps assaulting them, even killing them. All of that happened because there was an external stressor pushing down their emotional empathy so that their narcissistic traits and manipulative behaviours came to the fore, now no longer fettered by their emotional empathy. Accordingly, as I often explain, empaths are not saints, and in certain instances, empaths can be driven to behave in particularly horrendous ways. With regard, of course, to the appearance of what looked like emotional empathy, this could, in fact, be cognitive fake empathy and is actually a facade. With regard to the second point, the commission of an emotional empathy-free act is usually a one-off event or a short series of events over a short period of time until the external stressor disappears and their emotional empathy returns. Furthermore, the external stressor in Lucy Letby's case would need to be substantial to allow the covert killing of babies. This wasn't a teen mother, inexperienced and exhausted, who shakes a baby to death that won't stop crying. This was an inexperienced, rested, competent individual, acting in a professional capacity. Lucy Letby killed, and then carried on living, at least at service level, a normal life. She killed and went to the pub with friends. She killed and went on holiday. She killed and went shopping. This pattern of behaviour went on for over a year, with periods of calm in between each killing. Is there an external stressor, and a substantial one, that perhaps popped up intermittently creating this pattern? There's no evidence of any illness, no evidence of relationship problems or breakdown. Indeed, she didn't have an obvious boyfriend. There's no evidence of financial problems, stress from work, bereavement or such like, that might create this external stressor. Accordingly, given that murdering babies denotes a complete absence of emotional empathy, and there is no evidence to support a pattern of intermittent and substantial extinguishing of emotional empathy to create a broken empath who intermittently killed, we must reject empath as an outcome. Next, we consider the normal. A normal individual has both narcissistic and empathic traits. Sometimes they lean more towards empathic, sometimes they lean more towards narcissistic. A normal person will have substantial emotional empathy for a small circle of people around them. Friends, family, their children, their parents, siblings, maybe some colleagues, neighbours. They don't have it for strangers, acquaintances, those outside of the circle of emotional empathy. Normals can be manipulative, but they're not ordinarily governed by that manipulative behaviour. Normals can mistreat other individuals, but it's not habitual. Normals can act unpleasantly and badly to those outside of their circle of empathy. For example, an internet troll who spends their time writing nasty messages to people that they don't actually know, or somebody who gets into a fight with a stranger in a pub. But that's a combination of the fact that there was either no or low emotional empathy towards those individuals to begin with, 
and an external stressor. For example, the argument on the internet or rowing with a stranger in a pub. It is possible that since these babies were strangers to Lucy Letby, she would have low or no emotional empathy towards them. But why then would she be killing some and not all? It's possible that the opportunity to kill was not always there. But judging from the evidence, she had further opportunities beyond the instances where she actually did attack the children, where she killed, and instances where she attacked but did not kill. This might again point to an intermittent factor affecting her emotional empathy reducing or extinguishing it. But this intermittent factor would not need to be as substantial as it would be in the case of the empath, as her pre-existing level of emotional empathy as a normal would be far lower. Notwithstanding this difference to the position of an empath, there is again no evidence of a suitable external stressor that would account for such an intermittent pattern. What about a psychological condition attached to her normalcy? Outwardly, she projected as a normal, kind to friends, family and colleagues. Might some kind of condition have caused her to depart from normality and then murder people? There are two clear points against this. One, there is no evidence of a separate condition such as psychotic breaks or schizophrenia. There is no reporting that she was hearing voices, that she was seeing coded messages, for instance, in the registration plates of cars, that she thought that she was being followed by agents who had an agenda against her, etc. And two, if there was such a condition, it would have manifested at other occasions and not just every time she was working on the neonatal ward, i.e. she might have viciously gone at a friend, labouring under some kind of psychotic delusion. It might have been the case that she was arrested in the store for having some form of breakdown from reality. None of that happened. Accordingly, we also reject normal. Next we consider, is she narcissistic but not a narcissist? Such an individual has mainly narcissistic traits, some but limited empathic traits, has limited emotional empathy, but largely operates without emotional empathy to a wide range of people. This possibility of being narcissistic but not a narcissist can be addressed in short order. Since we've discounted empath and normal, the behaviour she presented to the world at large must have been a facade. A narcissistic person would not operate a facade in the way that Lucy Letby did. They would be far more obviously self-absorbed, selfish, dismissive, argumentative and judgmental. You would not witness such long periods of outwardly kind, calm and caring behaviour. Accordingly, we can now reject narcissistic. This now leaves us with either psychopath, antisocial personality disorder, narcissistic psychopath, antisocial personality disorder and narcissistic personality disorder, or narcissist, narcissistic personality disorder, or something else altogether. Let us begin by examining psychopath. As I mentioned earlier, this appears to be the natural choice for someone who has coldly and clinically murdered children. A psychopath can operate a facade, usually seen with a higher functioning psychopath. We know Letby was moderate to high in terms of intelligence, meaning higher functioning. Psychopathy could apply to her. She was evidently cold, callous, and there was some calculation with regard to her crimes. She attacked when other staff and parents were not around. She used covert means to murder, the injection of air, feed and insulin, which fit with the behaviour of a psychopath. She clearly has no emotional empathy, which also fits with the behaviour of a psychopath. The taking of another person's life is perhaps the ultimate in the administration of power and similarly to be found in a psychopath. The rush, the thrill experienced by snuffing out someone else's life would fit with the drive to seek thrills and alleviate the boredom experienced by a psychopath. What about someone who kills, kills defenceless babies, and so cruelly, surely that could only be a psychopath? Well, not every person who kills is a psychopath. In fact, a lot are not, and not every psychopath kills, particularly those which are higher functioning. 
The manner of the deaths does not automatically equate with the psychopath. Letby pleaded not guilty, and therefore she put the parents through the trauma of a trial. That reinforces not only the absence of emotional empathy, but it is a psychopathic trait. The fact Letby told one parent, trust me, I'm a nurse, she has a wielding of power commensurate with the behaviour of a psychopath. We therefore have evidence that supports her being a psychopath. Letby does not exhibit impulsivity, which is a marked behaviour of the psychopath. However, not all psychopaths are habitually impulsive, particularly higher-functioning ones, so the absence of impulsivity does not automatically preclude her from being a psychopath. Many psychopaths are charming. Letby is not. While she has a functioning facade of pleasantness and kindness, she has not been described as charming. Likeable, but not magnetic. A psychopath does almost everything for a reason, to benefit themselves, such as a level of self-centeredness. But what benefit did Lucy Letby gain from killing babies? Did it advance her career? No, it actually threatened to hinder it, and eventually ended it. Did it make her more popular, cause her to gain friends? No. Did it make her wealthy? No. It could be said, however, it served a purpose in alleviating boredom and giving her a sense of power. One would have expected, however, the killing of children to serve more purpose f than that for a psychopath. For example, a psychopath might kill a competing drug dealer to take him out of the market or frame a business rival for a crime so that their business goes under, allowing the business of the psychopath to flourish. Her failure to attend sentencing also goes against being a psychopath. The psychopath would not care about condemnation or disapproval and would be more likely to attend and exhibit their defiance. The meekness and anxiety she experienced and exhibited on arrest and in court also does not fit with a psychopath. The psychopath would be unmoved, unbothered and unconcerned. The diagnosis that she was given of post-traumatic stress disorder doesn't fit with the psychopath. Potentially, she might feign it in order to secure more favourable treatment. But to a psychopath, this would be seen as weakness and rejected. Remember, the psychopath is comfortable with who they are. We embrace the emptiness and delight in what we are. There are some people who think that they're psychopaths and that talk about it being a miserable existence. They're not psychopaths. Psychopaths like being what they are. Letby did not exhibit such behaviours. Letby left documents lying around which provided problematic evidence. A psychopath wouldn't do that. The content of the post-it notes is not the writing of a psychopath. It's far too pity-playing. If a psychopath wrote it, it would be a clinical record of what has been done and or dismissive and contemptuous of others and proud of what they'd actually gone and done. The, re the contents of the post-it notes was far too self-pitying for a psychopath. The removal of hospital notes might be seen as trophy gathering, which is something a psychopath might well do, although, as I've pointed out, leaving them lying around for detection is not the behaviour of a psychopath. Some have suggested that she wanted to be caught. A psychopath would not want that, as it would reflect badly in terms of the wielding of power and means that the game has now ended. The psychopath wants the games to continue to be played. In fact, it's usually non-pathological individuals who want to be caught or are relieved when they are, because they then become relieved of the burden of guilt that they have been carrying that has made their life too difficult. The psychopath or narcissist or narcissistic psychopath does not have such a burden of guilt. There are, accordingly, several factors which reduce the likelihood of her being a psychopath, and a further factor to my mind, and the most telling, is that there has not been a sustained period of antisocial behaviour from Letby. Her offending towards the babies commenced in 2015 and went on for approximately 13 months. When she has been in custody for two years, there have been no reports of problematic behaviour with fellow prisoners, prison guards and staff. There is a suggestion that her pattern of harming babies actually goes back to 2012, and I shall be addressing that in a separate video. But that is purely at an investigative stage, and the evidence related to that has not been subjected to trial. Nevertheless, there is no history of prior offending, 
She was a studious pupil. She was a dutiful daughter. There is no evidence from friends, from school, from college, from university, from colleagues of criminal or antisocial behaviour. It's possible that her behaviour in front of her parents has been masked. More about that later. But to behave in such a blemish-free existence prior to the killing of the babies is powerful evidence that she does not make it across the line for being found to be a psychopath. Even your glorious narrator, with my high executive function, engaged in theft, assaults and arson, amongst other behaviours in my early years. Lucy Letby was described as a Mary Poppings character, with no evidence or even a hint of antisocial behaviours. It is for that fundamental reason, and the others earlier advanced, that the finding is that Lucy Letby is not a psychopath. She does not have antisocial personality disorder, but she does have psychopathic tendencies. Given the finding that she is not a psychopath, she cannot be a narcissistic psychopath. Thus, that classification is also dispensed with. Thus, we are now left with the consideration of is she a narcissist or is there another classification, perhaps, that is applicable to her? Letby almost died at birth. This has shaped her parents' attitude towards her, has shaped her worldview and has given her a platform to triangulate with her parents. From the evidence, it is clear that as an only child and a child who almost didn't come into the world, Lucy Letby was very special to her parents, and they doted on her, mothering her, smothering her, guarding her, and protecting her. On her arrest, her mother said, take me instead. Her parents dealt with the hospital when she was first investigated. Her father tackled the chief executive. They repeatedly rode into battle on her behalf. They enabled her to purchase her home. They were in contact with her every single day. They attended trial every day. Letby spoke about how they made her feel guilty, or at least what she interpreted as guilt, because she had moved away from home at Hereford. Letby was smothered, and she could not thrive in such an environment whereby everything was either done for her or she was instructed as to how she should behave. She would have been told how special she was, that she was a miracle baby, and this created a lack of control environment, one of the prerequisites for the creation of a narcissist. Parents with emotional empathy, either empaths or normals, could naturally protect a child. But they'd also recognise boundaries, understand a child has to do things for themselves and learn by being left to their own devices to make their own mistakes. They would exhibit emotional empathy by behaving in such a manner. The smothering level of control exhibited at Oda Lucy Letby is to such an extent that it could only come from another narcissist, either her mother or her father, and quite possibly both. That means that since only a narcissist would exhibit such a level of control towards her as she experienced, therefore the genetic predisposition had the potential to be passed to Lucy Letby from one or more of her parents, and, since she was subjected to the lack of control environment, would mean there was a likelihood of becoming a narcissist. Accordingly, we have the foundation for Letby being a narcissist, but it does not alone mean that she is definitely one. We have to look at more evidence. We know Lucy Letby has no emotional empathy because she murdered babies. Narcissists have no emotional empathy. She clearly exhibited cognitive empathy, being seen as kind by friends, some of whom still do not accept that she murdered the babies, such as the level of Letby's convincing cognitive empathy, but also by colleagues, parents and others. I have previously described in the evidence the many compliments about Letby's compassion and caring nature. Certain narcissists have cognitive empathy. She evidently operated with a facade of kindness and normality but since we know it is a facade facades are also prone to crack this was not actually frequent with Letby at least from the available evidence but it did happen on one occasion we know that she would repeatedly correct and admonish colleagues who made mistakes exhibiting haughtiness 
Certain colleagues described her as not universally popular and having an air of superiority. Further, she cried for herself in court, but not in relation to those that she killed. I also believe that her parents will have witnessed repeated poor behaviours, but for their own facade needs and the need to assert control, they have never spoken of it. I believe Letby would have repeatedly sought to assert control over her parents by triangulating them with her near-death birth. You need to help me buy a house. After all, you nearly killed me. You need to lend me money and start proving that I am special to you. After all, you keep saying I am. Well, time to prove it. I hate you. Why won't you do what I want? You should have let me die. Letby will have undoubtedly maintained like certain narcissists of facade to the outside world, thus friends, colleagues, neighbours largely saw her as normal, kind and caring. Even the police saw her as vanilla and beige. But she will have exhibited malign manipulative behaviours behind closed door to her parents. While showing the world that she was a good daughter, her parents were proud of that, and that provided a facade for them. It suited her parents' needs, and also, because it suited their needs, it has meant that she has maintained a silence with regard to how she has behaved and in particular there has been a silence from her parents about her behaviour towards them. They didn't want to damage the facade that existed for both them in relation to their daughter and for her. Lucy Letby has repeatedly exhibited a need for control. She has achieved this through benign manipulations, for instance, being kind to her friends, caring for hundreds of babies, being seen as a diligent and enthusiastic worker. And we know they are manipulations because she has no emotional empathy. She has also exhibited control through malign manipulations, admonishing colleagues, murdering children, blaming colleagues for her crimes, dirling out pity plays in court and with regard to the hospital investigation. She has sown responses to when her control is threatened, flattery to the married doctor, triangulation of the doctor, triangulation of staff and parents with the children that she has harmed, and especially when she was being exposed following her arrest. She has exhibited a need for fuel. Her harming the children was to provoke a response from the married doctor so that he would react, to provoke a response from other staff and the parents. She attacked twins and triplets because in such circumstances this would mean that the parents would still be around in relation to the surviving children so that she could witness their grief. She could witness the aftermath of what she had done and drink of that fuel. She created life-threatening situations so she could drink in the fuel from the reaction of misery and grief or praise and admiration where she aided resuscitation. Either way, she was winning because she was gaining the fuel. She went and checked on Facebook repeatedly because memorialised grief would provide her with fuel from the still grieving parents. Her affair with the married doctor showed no emotional empathy for his wife, demonstrated a lack of boundary recognition, exhibited a sense of entitlement and a lack of accountability. She readily constructed circumstances which allowed her to maintain the residual benefit of a facade of caring, to assert control by appearing to care, to draw fuel from people's responses. The fact she believed she could never have a family and would not marry presented a persistent threat to control. The content of the post-it note was a pity play, designed to gain control through an indirect assertion of control. The killing of babies was not only the ultimate assertion of control, it acted to nullify the threats posed by her fear of being meaningless and not special. It dealt with the rampant envy that she experienced in relation to seeing parents having that which she did not, children. It dealt with the envious nature that she had in relation to their contentment at being married and bringing new life into the world, things that she did not have. All of her life, she had been made to believe that she was very special, that she was the centre of the universe, and she believed this delusion. 
And yet, such a special person feared not having a family, feared not being married, feared subconsciously being unimportant and not mattering. And those fears amounted to repeated and sustained threats to her control. Furthermore, at work, she was just another nurse. And this ordinariness was used as a cover, but it also was a further threat to her need for control, which she countered on some occasions by being a diligent and industrial, industrious worker, which garnered praise and reaped rewards, when she became, for instance, the poster girl. But it was not enough, and therefore she needed to feel important, powerful, and in control. And to achieve that, she needed people to react to her further, and thus she attacked and killed babies to gain that control and the fuel by way of people responding so that she could be that special Lucy once again. She has exhibited a self-absorbed nature as shown by the comments on the post-it note. She's shown a lack of accountability through the lies that she has told, the fact that she has no genuine friends, that she never regards herself as, fo as at fault, she has exhibited grandiosity with the air of superiority, the belief that she would not get caught. She shows magical thinking because she sees herself as the arbiter of life and death. She shows haughtiness as a consequence of her dismissive behaviours. She's manipulative, as shown by the use of flattery, the telling of lies, triangulation with object, triangulation with person, the use of, in essence, physical violence towards babies, pity plays, false compassion, invalidation, Withdrawal, denial, guilt, provocation, projection, blame shifting, triangulation with children, use of threat, the revision of history, deflection, false accusations, and there are likely many other manipulations that we have not yet been exposed to. Such has been the effectiveness of her facade and the continuing silence of her parents. She has shown poor boundary recognition with regard to the way that she has behaved towards the children the way that she's interfered in the relationship of the doctor, the way that she's breached confidences by taking away confidential information from the hospital. She shows significant aspects of the narcissistic dynamic with regard to there being familial discord, facade management, treating others as an extension of self, character trait acquisition, black and white thinking, exhibiting a need to assert control, exhibiting a response to a perceived threat to that control, objectification, compartmentalization, hoovering, delusion. She shows a complete absence of emotional empathy occasioned by the commission of infidelity with the doctor, her manipulative behaviours, the fact that she has killed, the fact that she has killed babies, the fact that she caused considerable pain to those babies. The fact that she chose newborn babies as the most effective method of gaining that control is demonstrative of her cowardice and also the selection of easy and proximate targets. They were available, defenceless, and attacking a baby guaranteed the most immediate and possibly highest emotional response that could ever be garnered from other people. The method by which she injured and killed them, causing them terrible pain, allied with her selection of defenceless targets, demonstrates sadism. She delighted in what she caused, anticipating, like a predatory wolf, the responses which would fuel her, savouring that rush of fuel which underlines her sadism. Her use of harming others to gain a response does accord with Munchausen syndrome by proxy. However, those of you who have accessed my videos about that subject will know that I explain that Munchausen syndrome by proxy is invariably carried out by narcissists and as such is just another form of manipulation and another dynamic of narcissism as opposed to an actual separate and distinct condition. My detailed examination of the evidence confirms that Lucy Letby is a narcissist with a sadistic streak and psychopathic tendencies. This has been a most detailed examination and I'm pleased that you have enjoyed it. Thank you to those of you who have donated by way of super thanks, and if you have not done so already, I wish to exhibit your gratitude by ensuring that your glorious narrator's voice remains well lubricated by some dirt's champagne, then please do feel free to make a donation in that regard.
We've now established what Lucy Letby is. I'm now, in a separate video, going to move on to what it was that actually made her kill now that we know that she was a sadistic narcissist with psychopathic tendencies. This will enable us to address the suggestions of was it an addiction to a code blue scenario that made her kill? Was it a god complex that made her kill? What are the other theories about what made her kill? Now we're able to examine those with greater clarity because we know that Lucy Letby convicted murderer of babies, is a sadistic narcissist with psychopathic tendencies. I'm H.G. Tudor. Thank you for listening.